Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, the stand down order to LDS women. Today's date is November 26, 2023. It is the Sunday of Thanksgiving weekend. And just over this weekend, I believe it was this past Friday, there was a newspaper article that was published in the Salt Lake Tribune regarding women and their status, for lack of a better word, in several stakes in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I've got several people, several women who are on the show to give their takes and their understandings of this order, how it is that it was perceived by them when they learned about it. But before that, before I bring them on, I want to read just the very first few paragraphs of this article from the Salt Lake Tribune, which was written by Peggy Fletcher Stack. It was originally published on November 24th, 2023, and it was updated just yesterday on November 25th, 2023. It is titled, A Slap in the Face, LDS Relief Society Leaders Ordered Off the Stand. Area president puts an end to this Bay Area tradition. Many women are asking why. So the very first few paragraphs of this article, which is all I'll be reading today, it seemed like such a simple act of inclusion. Having female Relief Society leaders sitting on the stand, facing the pews during Latter-day Saint Sunday services has been a non-controversial tradition among some congregations in the San Francisco Bay Area for a decade or more. But to many women in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the public presence of women sitting side by side with male ecclesiastical authorities sent a powerful signal they were an important and essential part of the community's leadership. Apparently, though, even that small symbol was too much for some of the faith's male leaders. The practice was abruptly discontinued last month. So this being November, last month was October. So it appears that this happened last October and only now is the press getting wind of it. The practice was abruptly discontinued last month, according to church spokesperson, Doug Anderson. At the order of the North American West Area president, whose jurisdiction includes California. The Utah-based faith has a long-established practice when it comes to worship services, Anderson said. So this is the statement by the spokesperson, i.e. by the church, justifying the change. The Utah-based faith, i.e. the LDS church, has a long-established practice when it comes to worship services. The general pattern includes presiding authorities sitting on the stand, along with other women, men, youth, and children, based on their invitation to participate in the service. Local leaders, Anderson says, were recently reminded of this practice. Now, they put it in a positive sense. In other words, the people who are allowed to sit on the stand do not include the Female Relief Society presidency, but it can include women so long as they're, they've been invited to participate in the service. Okay, so that's the first few paragraphs of that article. I want to bring on our guests. First off, we have from Utah, Lila Tuller. Second, from Virginia, Martine Derrick Smith. And last but certainly not least, from the San Francisco Bay Area, Carol Lynn Pearson. Hi, everybody. Now, Hi, Carol Lynn Pearson. Thanks for inviting us. Oh, I'm so glad to have all of yes. you on the show. Believe me, on very short notice, thank you so much for responding. Now, Carolyn Pearson, you are actually on the ground. You live and attend church in the stakes where this has happened. Because of that, I'm actually going to come to you at the end of the first round of three, because I'd like to hear from Lila first and then Martine. What were your initial reactions to reading this article? Where were you when you heard about it? And what went through your mind? Mm -hmm. Lila first. Wow. Well, the first thing I thought of was, is it really that big of a deal that an area authority would have to basically kick the women off the stand? And then I thought a little further, what would be the impetus 
to do that. And the only thing I can think of is it's a threat. It's some kind of a threat to their um, patriarchy. That's, that's just, those were my first thoughts. Okay. Martine? Um, well, I printed the article uh, yesterday, but I, I heard about it Friday. I uh, can't remember where I, where I was. I'm visiting in Virginia right now, but, you know, I read it. And uh, the, the picture, the, the first two pictures show the general presidency, the Relief Society, young women and primary. So I was really confused uh, at first because I thought, well, they're not kicking them off the stand, are they, suddenly, after actually having them move them front and center in recent years. Uh, so I, re I read the article and realized that, no, this was, I have friends, one especially, uh, she's really the sister of a friend who lives in the area and is progressive. And I know that this is something that, you know, I had heard was being done uh, in the Bay Area and was very welcome by the members in general and by the women there. So, okay, so an area authority, was he acting on his own or was he acting with, uh, you know, from directives from Salt Lake? Uh, at this point, I would think President Oaks is probably mostly in charge. Uh, so that was, that was my uh, initial reaction. Where did this come from? Why after so long? <laughs> You know, certainly I, I have heard, in, I have seen in social media previously, uh, you know, some references to some of the progressive actions that have been taken in the, in the church in the Bay Area. And, you know, some members, some non-progressive members, uh, you know, opining about, you know, they're sort of uh, unruly out, uh, over there and they need to be brought back in and and... Those were my, my thoughts in the, uh, I tend to parse words. So when the church issues a, a statement, uh, in this case, again, through Doug Anderson, who seems to be the point man recently for the church, um, this, uh, this paragraph, the Utah-based faith, quote, has a long established practice when it comes to worship services. The general pattern includes presiding authorities. Long established practice is a tradition. It is not doctrine. It is not scriptural. The general pattern, again, that's, that's a general pattern. Uh, the general pattern can be modified and, and often is. Uh, I've been in more than one missionary, I'm going to say missionary homecoming or farewell, where the chapel is crowded, people come in, you know, a little bit late, and the conducting officer is at the stand and, and says, here, there's plenty of room behind me. You don't have to go sit in the back. Come sit, come sit in the choir seats. That, they, they, they don't have a function. Everybody knows that, but there are seats there, and anybody's welcome to sit in them. So those were some of my thoughts. Okay, very good. Carolyn Pearson, now I understand that this was not a surprise to you when the article was published because you live and are very active in the stakes where this is going on. For me, as well as for probably the majority of Latter-day Saints, we learned about this practice in the San Francisco Bay Area wards and stakes at the same time we learned that it was discontinued, i.e. a couple of days ago. Can you tell us what's been going on there and what's led up to this? Sure, as far as I'm able to perceive it, this is this is what happened. Now, I do live in, in Walnut Creek, California, which is in the Bay Area in the Oakland stake and the Oakland stake I am told does have a reputation of being the most liberal liberal stake in the church um, and this whole thing just really took me by surprise in fact I'm I am missing church to be here with you don't tell anybody <laughs> um, I I continue to attend here and I continue to be well known in my war in my stake as a as a feminist, but I am also very much loved 
and then that that might surprise you, but but that is the case. So um, the first thing that I learned about this at all, and it coincidentally this happened to be when Peggy Fletcher Stack was visiting here, she was giving a presentation in our state, and I in fact uh, was able to have a private visit with her because we just wanted to talk about some stuff. And um, she had <clears throat> later, after a conversation, she had, no, I guess this was prior to our conversation. She had attended the Berkeley Ward where something unusual had happened. They had released these two women who had been uh, operating as not bishops counselors, but bishops uh, assistants. And that had been going on for about nine years when um, a bishop who had been called to be in the Berkeley ward uh, as their new bishop said, I will do it on one condition that you are allowing me to have two female assistants. We're not going to call them counselors. They're, we're going to call them assistants and they will have specific uh, requirements that I give them to work in our ward and they will sit up on the stand with me. So that passed whatever was necessary here and, and that happened. And that's been something that the Berkeley ward has appreciated for all well, these many, at least nine years. So the thing that, that happened that particular day was that these, these women were officially, you know, and raise the hand to um, to thank them for their service. But the the ward was very upset that this that this had happened. And I, I didn't know that it was any further thing than that until we began to have email conversations round and about uh, me with some of the other women and with some of the men in in our ward. In, in our stake who were really confused and they didn't this did not rest well with them that to have this 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 happen so in some of these emails i was reading well okay here's from one of the male leaders that i am close to and really appreciate what are the brethren afraid of about women so that is what it comes down to for me that somehow there is and who knows how local it is, but I think there is generalized in our church right now, a fear of the power of women. And that this particular time and place just happened to be the one that, that sort of got the attention and that something happened in. But I think it does reflect something a lot larger than, than just our, our stake because there is a kind of retrenchment going on from the leadership in Salt Lake, as we know, things about, you know, reigning in BYU and a lot of various things like that. So, so we are in this, this strange time. And, and I remember when I, I visited with Peggy uh, on that particular occasion, I said, Peggy, somebody needs to write something about this. Could you? And, she said, oh, it's not, I don't, it's not large enough for what I'm, but evidently it became large enough <laughs> because she did this really significant, large, mm -hmm. appointed article about what was going on. And she did a wonderful job of it. And so that's, that's the background as, as I understand it. Well, thank you for that. Something that did occur to me, and we talked yesterday on the phone, Carol Lynn, about how much is, of this is the area authority, whose name is not published in the article, but mm -hmm. whose name actually is Mark Bragg. He's the, the area president, I believe, mm -hmm. who would have issued this order. Is that correct, Carolyn? Yes, that is. Okay. So we will mention his name here. And um, yesterday I had wondered why they made that choice, because it was obvious a choice to make to include the name of the church spokesperson, Doug Anderson, but not to include the name of the person who gave the order, even though his title is referenced at least once, maybe twice in the article. But then I thought about it more this morning and I thought, you know, uh, Peggy Fletcher Stack 
is running with the story. So maybe she has to do a few things in order to make it more even sided, not so one sided to the leaders of the church. I have no idea, but I want to give her props for running with the story. Now, what we were thinking about was, is this a rogue area president, right? Is he acting on his own authority or did he clear it with the top leaders before he made this move? Now, we can't tell that from this perspective, but what I can say from this perspective is that regardless of whether he made the decision without consulting top leaders, which I think is unlikely, or if they found out about it after the fact, like the rest of us did, I think it's pretty incontrovertible that the church as an institution is backing this decision, which they did through their official church spokesperson, Doug Anderson, because he was justifying the decision in the statement that he made to the press. Now, any thoughts about this? Let's go to, um, can we go to Martine first now? Any thoughts that what I've said or what Carolina said bring to your mind or anything else that you want to just throw into the pot? Uh, I sort of doubt that he acted independently. My understanding is that he was state president uh, in LA a number of years ago, spoke with someone yesterday whose son was one of the financial clerks when he was a state president there, and that he was quite chill, I think, is the way the son referred to him. That Does that he mean he's liked, cool? Uh, yeah, that, uh, that the son liked working with him. But, uh, I don't know that he, he didn't use the word progressive, but that he thought he was quite open-minded and, and chill. So, uh, you know, like, like most things, such things in the church, we'll never know. But uh, and I'm glad that Carolyn uh, reminded us of the, I, I remember hearing about the female assistants to the bishop. And, uh, it, you know, if, if that happened, that the release happened recently, and then this, uh, you know, they're stamping down on creativity creatively including women is not allowed okay lila yeah i have a question what does anyone know why the area president was there was there a reorg going on what was the purpose of his visit i don't have any information that he was physically mm. in, okay. in our in our, uh, in our area looking around Perhaps so but okay. I, I have no information about that. Okay. So I think it could have been just totally a long distance thing. And mm -hmm. I, I suggest it could have been looked at as, well, this is not a big deal. I mean, uh, it, you know, it's just a little cosmetic thing here. We're just going to, you know, even things out. And I do not believe that the brethren in Salt Lake understand that what's going on with women is a big deal. Yeah. What is it that they don't understand about it, Carolyn? And I'll throw this to anybody else afterward, too. Why is it that men could see this as a minor cosmetic change, but it could be such a big deal to women and other men as well? Well, because there are... Well, this this is so complex. This is this is braided so weirdly that yes, in in our LDS culture, I mean, we know that 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 women are important, but they're just there, like the wallpaper is there, in a lot of ways. Uh, so I I think there could be. You know, it's just a, a certain allowance of, you know, okay, so it, 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 over, over here in, in the Oakland area, they're, you know, the, the re rearranging the, the stand and, and that that's all right. I, 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 I believe that this article took a lot of uh, male leaders of the church by surprise. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really do. Okay. And uh, we'll uh, go to Lila and then, oh, Martine, oh, since okay. you're raising your hand, we'll call yeah. on you. Um, you know, a couple of months ago, uh, the Salt Lake Tribune had a, an anniversary uh, podcast that was live on stage with Richard and Claudia Bushman. And uh, I, my husband and I attended with another 
a couple uh, friends of ours. And Claudia uh, was asked the question, <coughs> this had to do with Exponent 2, and I don't want to get into, you know, the Exponent 2 magazine that she edited and, and uh, produced for a number of years. Uh, she said that women are free to do whatever they want in the church. But then later on, when talking about Exponent 2, she said that when Richard was called the state president, she was told by the visiting authority that she would have to give up exponent two, which she did. And to me, that's even more important than the fact that she was told. She did as she was told. Uh, and then she went on later uh, to say, you know, this was after saying women can do anything they want in the church, within the church structure. And yeah. then she talked about, she has all these ideas, these projects, she always goes to the bishop and gets them approved before she proceeds. So I think she and I have a very different understanding of women can do, are free to do anything they want in the church of their own initiative. Okay. Lila, any thoughts from you? Yeah. <laughs> I feel <laughs> like um, women, my experience in the church, and I was in it for, well, from birth till I was 57 when I finally left. Um, I felt that we got a lot of platitudes. Like we were told how wonderful we are, how important we are, how, you know, we're more righteous. Therefore, we don't need the priesthood or, or things along that line. So they would never come out and say that. But that was sort of the overall feeling is don't feel bad you don't have the priesthood because you don't need it. You're so wonderful you get to mother children and you get you're you're the righteous you know god loves jesus loves women so much and then to have this happen you know i felt patronized in the church by the leadership and 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 placated in some ways whenever i would feel badly that i was down on the pew with my seven kids while my husband was in a bishopric in a singles ward for six years. And I was wrestling those kids by myself on the bench. I wasn't sitting on the stand with my husband and then, you know, I was doing the hard work and in, 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 as far as I felt it, with my kids. Um, and yet, you know, we're kind of told that this is all for the greater good and, and, and not to complain. And it just surprises me that they tell us that we're so wonderful and yet they don't allow us to sit on the stand. That's such a blatant, like she said, slap in the face. <clears throat> it's so jarring to read this because I didn't even know that that was allowed at all anyway, but to hear that it had been allowed for a decade or more and then to have some guy just with the brush of a hand say that can't happen anymore. And it's not, it's, it's not said by the church, it's just by this area authority. So we don't know if he was rogue or, or what was going on. And, and I questioned that too, Martine. I wondered, is this guy just, you know, having a moment where he wants to exercise control? I don't know. But to, to read this article and hear of the women that live there and, and you too, Carolyn, where you're, you're, you're actually there seeing this happen, the men may see it as just nothing. You know, we're just making a little cosmetic change to the women. This is one little tiny crumb that we've been given off of a giant loaf of bread to be able to sit on the stand as if we matter because they tell us we matter. But apparently we don't matter enough to be able to be included mm. there. That's hurtful. That's very hurtful. Yes, and let, let me make sure that we understand that the in this area here, the men took this very seriously. The men did not just slough this off. Right. I yeah. It, it, it's the men way up here there that yeah. are, are are making this happen, and there was a lot of hurt felt by the men down here who wanted to keep mm. to to advocate. For a fuller presence of women, they felt squashed as well. Yeah. 
Now, if I may, I would like to broaden our view for a moment here, because I want to talk about Jesus just for a second or two, or a minute or more. <laughs> you know, our church, goes, our church is going to great length these days to make sure that we are understood to be the, the, the church of Jesus Christ. And it's wonderful for us to commit to saying, you know, he's, he's really, I mean, everybody should feel comfortable that Jesus is the leader that we need to follow the way he conducted himself and the way he gave us a vision for how society might be. So if we are going to be the, truly the followers of, of Jesus, one of the things he did was to be so radically inclusive of women. That's one of the things that got him in trouble. He was radically inclusive. So much so that some of his male followers, you know, complained that Mary was getting more of his attention than, than they. So, so if we are to pattern ourselves in the church after Christ, it would not necessarily be the, the specifics, perhaps, but we should therefore show a radical inclusion of women as it looks in our day and age. Mm -hmm. We are not doing that. We are exhibiting a radical Uh, a, a, a radical in exclusivity regarding women, uh, such as, I mean, Jesus would never have said, you, you've got to always be lower than I am. But it, it, this thing, it's, it's so embarrassing what we're seeing now, that physically the women have to be lower hmm. than the men except for the occasion when they were invited to come up here. And so, you know, to me, it, I, I have just been so embarrassed mm. to see this happen mm. because it is so unchristlike. And in fact, if, if, if I may continue for just a moment, I, I want to read a poem that I wrote a long time ago. Please. Fact, I, wrote, I wrote this poem at the invitation of the general authorities of the church in 1973. That was a time when a, the, the, the strange thing had happened that my little book of poems beginnings put me on the map. I was quoted by the brethren at the pulpit and they invited me uh, to, to be on the program of this wonderful dinner, a post-conference dinner that they had every six months after a conference, the general authorities and their wives came together for a, a banquet. And they, and they had a, a, a program afterwards of some of the people in the limelight of performing. And they invited me to create a new poem and present it there, which, which I did. And synchronistically, this is the one that I, I, I wrote for them and, and presented it to, to them. At, and then they loved it. They loved it. And they did not know some of the undercurrent that even way back then, back in 73, I was a very aware Mormon woman observing these sexual inequalities. So, and, and this is a poem that I think we can well remember today in terms of what being a leader is really ought to be about. This is titled, He Who Would Be Chief Among You. And he rose from supper, poured water in a basin, and washed the disciples' feet. Those hands, hardened by the heat of a desert sun, comfortable with cutting trees and turning them to tables in Joseph's shop. Those hands that with a wave could stop the troubled sea, could touch a leper clean, or triumphantly turn death away from the loved daughter on Jairus's couch. 
those hands that could gesture the heavens open, poured water in a basin, and washed the disciples' feet. The lesson lies unlearned, but to a few who trust the paradox and hear the call, he who would be chief among you, let him be the servant of all. Now, I happen to know that in my church, a church that I continue to love and to serve, there are huge numbers of men as well as women who would like for that to be the foundation from which we serve. And it is uh, with, in that context that I just feel embarrassment that we're having this, this odd moment where we understand how far we have to go in really becoming the kind of people that Jesus, in whose name our, 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 our church exists, theoretically, still is at a place where we, we cannot bring ourselves to really behave the way that Jesus asked us to, to simply serve and love one another and not to have this kind of embarrassing hierarchy that serves nobody. Thank you for gracing us with that poem, Carolyn. That was wonderful. I want to make this observation that's been made before and get your takes on it, all right, which is one of the things that's so perplexing about this entire issue is the comparison with the seating of women, uh, general auxiliary, you know, Relief Society presidency, primary presidency, young women's presidency on the stand with the men at general conference. And this has been going on for a few years now. They've traditionally been over here on the side, all clustered together. But even in the most recent general conference last October, which was last month, they had moved them from their place on the side to a row among the men. And they were front and center now instead of off to the side. This was a definite choice that was made and sanctioned, obviously, by those in authority in the church. And yet we have a similar situation apparently going on in a local level for some time, and that gets discontinued by the same brethren who are okay with the women sitting front and center. And once again, Doug Anderson's statement in support of it is key to me that this is obviously not a rogue operator on an area level. This is sanctioned by the top leadership. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the spokesperson for the church wouldn't be supporting it. So what is the difference? Why is that happening? And I'll start with uh, Martine, go to Lila and back to Carolyn. It did occur to me this morning that at a minimum, at a minimum, it suggests that having women on the stand in general conference is not so much a matter of doing that because of equality or it's the right thing to do. But if you're doing it there, but not on a local level where, where people don't see it, it's not broadcast, then it may be it's done for a matter of appearance more than equality in general conference. If it were for equality, I would expect it would extend across the board. That's just a thought that occurred to me this morning. Any thoughts that you have on that, Martine, or on Carolyn's poem or anything else you want to say? Yeah, I, I have a couple of thoughts and then a question for Carolyn, actually. Um, actually, what happened last month in October, they, they have the, the women have been in the center section for several years now. What they did, and I remember messaging you about it, is that they've always been all nine of them seated together. And this time they had, I'm assuming probably the young men's presidency next to the young women's presidency. So it wasn't a straight line of nine women. So um, also to me, I see, and Carolyn can address that, the women sitting on the stand at General Conference is, is sending the message, they are part of the leadership of our church. The women at the ward level, I don't know if it was always the Relief Society president or the whole presidency and maybe 
um, you know, Carolyn can address that. There is, I think, for new members coming in, you know, so new move-ins or whatever, oh, those women, that's who I want to talk to after second meeting. I'm new. I, I Now I, I see immediately who the leaders are of my auxiliary. They Okay, they're not auxiliaries anymore. Of the women's organization. They're recognizable. They're not just sitting in the in the stand and with the in the congregation and with the churches the the ward's new organizational structure where the relief society president and the elders quorum president have taken on some of the shepherding functions that supposedly you know that were previously done by the bishop i don't know how well that's working because the bishop's supposed to dedicate his time to the youth specifically the young man no young man's presidency so I would think, uh, as someone, and you guys know that, as, as a chorister who sat on the stand with my husband, who didn't have a function anymore, who was a former bishop, by the way, who s sat on the stand for 10 years, I know that I saw things from the stand that you can't see as a Relief Society president, as an elders quorum president, sitting in the congregation looking at people's backs. You can't see their faces. You can't see the reactions. You can't, you, you can, you just, uh, 10 years on the stand, I got to know some of my ward members better. So I see that sort of as a, you know, a dual function. They are recognized. They are your part of your ward leadership. There's the bishop, his counselors, and there is the Relief Society president and the Elder Corps president. And they have important functions now, more so than they did a few years ago. And then there is uh, the fact that, yeah, they're, that they, from their viewpoint, their perspective is different if they can sit on the sand. And I would assume maybe it wasn't always the president. Maybe they took turns. So they, you know, maybe sometimes it was a counselor. But I would, I would say, yeah, let the elders quorum president sit on the sand too. So he can see his ward from that perspective as well, his ward members. Is that question? And my question and my yeah. question for Carol Lynn is how did you perceive that? So you've been watching it for 10 years. As a member, what did you perceive? Um, yeah, what did you perceive? I'm not being very precise, but how did you experience that? <clears throat> Um, I was not really intimately involved in, you know, the exact things that were going on, but I, I knew what was happening and I spoke to some of the women. I, I spoke to some of the male leaders and they just, they, they, they were just disheartened that they uh, were not able to, to protect what they felt was a good and useful thing. Um, <clears throat> So I don't. I, again, I, I want to. I want to widen our view mm -hmm. a little bit to maybe get a little better handle on what's happening here. <clears throat> Historically, well, as I sometimes try to to look at a very large picture. I, I, I look back at, you know, the, the history of women historically, and we, we know how bumpy that, that has been, how indefensible that has been. So here we are in a, in a, a time when, as, as, as I see it in my own mind, we're, we're moving historically in a really important direction. And as we look back in history and see how, you know, with all of the the the, the bumps and the thumps, it, it, in general, the human consciousness continued to get larger and larger about a number of things, certainly regarding women. So that we see that historically, it, it was essential that the Dark Ages move into the Enlightenment. That was an essential step. And in general, we have continued the road to enlightenment. So that right now we are in a place in history where we are and will continue 
to move across the plains of patriarchy into the promised land of partnership. Now, I see partnership as a beautiful word, and it doesn't mean to me that everybody will going to do the same kinds of things, but there will be equal valuing. And there are a lot of male minds that are so tied up in the concept of patriarchy that they will not budge to move us into this, what seems to me a beautiful word, which is partnership. And, and I think that tension is happening right now in, in our church, that there is fear in the, in the hearts and the minds of a lot of men of feeling they have to protect patriarchy at all costs. They have to protect the concept of priesthood leadership at all costs. And that it is, that is not, it's not viable. It is not a defensible, society is not going to rest in that place. We are going to continue to move toward this wonderful light of partnership where men and women can give equally their very best gifts and have them valued and, and, and not be so concerned about whose name is above whose name, whose physical presence is above the, the, the presence. The, the leadership will be ab a here above and the congregation that are led will be down here. We just won't have that kind of mentality when we move into, and, you know, the Rianne Eisler <clears throat> kind of broke the, this, this wonderful the era of, of talking about partnership with, with her book, uh, um, The Chalice and the Blade, showing how historically this has all <clears throat> happened and how much we have lost in, in, in the present. But history is moving forward. And the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is going to continue to move forward, I believe. Now, there was a, a, a phrase in, in this, this article that we're referring to that says, if we do not move along with this wave, we're going to continue a lot of, to lose a lot of women, a lot of young women. And boy, I see that happening. So I think the I think the the endurance of, of our church it depends on not not doing it belligerently, but doing it enthusiastically to bring young women, older women into the circle. A, a circle that does not rely on this hierarchical thing of I'm up here and you're down there. So I, I just see us at this point in history that is really, really important. And it is my hope that along with the human family in general, that our Mormon human family can, can understand the value of moving into partnership. Carolyn, I, I appreciate your vision. I share it. I think everybody on the panel shares it. I've got to ask you the question, though. How do you make sense, then, of what just happened in light of that vision? Mm -hmm. Because it sounds like we just lost a few wagons in a flash flood while we were crossing the plains. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I've used the word embarrassment, and, and I, I really find it embarrassing because I do not think it really reflects the general quality of the mindset and the spirit set of the the vast majority of, of latter-day saint women and men I, I i just don't i see it as an anomaly except that it is so powerful mm -hmm. and you know maybe i'm just speaking my wishes these are my <laughs> wishes. These are my hopes. <clears throat> and the reality might be that this determination to preserve the patriarchy at all costs 
it may be that that will be stronger, much stronger than, than my wish or, or my belief really that we're ready to move into partnership. So if, if it is so that, that, that the patriarchy is immovable, I think that will really um, indicate the death knell of this, this historical movement that we have seen that has been called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I want to go ahead. Thank you for that answer. I appreciate it very much. I want to read a text that I received from an individual who lives in one of the stakes that's affected. This is a, a man. I'm not able to give his name, but uh, he is married. His wife and family attend there as well. And he had sent this to me. So let me see if I can find it here. I want to read it. Then I want to get the reactions from Lila, then Martine, and then Carol Lynn to this. It, it starts with this. It is a huge deal out here. By that, it means in the San Francisco Bay Area. It is a huge deal out here. Women I never thought would disconnect are texting each other behind the scenes. It's a complete loss of authority for church leaders. One sign of how weak this was, just pathetic leadership, was the process. It's a coordinated effort to get women off the stand with no paper trail. The area authority, Mark Bragg, the area authority told state presidents to put an end to women sitting on the stand, but would not give them a letter to read. Didn't give a rationale or doctrinal basis. Said the local bishoprics were to write their own letters to read in church. No guidance on talking points. Dozens of women in my ward are upset about it. It didn't say upset, are upset about it and wrote emails to the state president. He wouldn't address any points over email, just said he was open to meeting to discuss. So again, no paper trail going down or up. Lastly, Salt Lake City never informed the global general Relief Society presidency about any of this. One of our Relief Society presidency here is friends with a member of the General Relief Society presidency. So I'm just guessing that's how they got this information that the General Relief Society presidency was not informed about any of this or consulted. Area Authority, Mark Bragg, did take a meeting with one Relief Society president in the Berkeley stake. He listened for a while, but then she was told to accept it and get in line. She's passing that around to other Relief Society presidents in the area. It's blowing up, period, end of the text to me from Ground Zero. Lila, your thoughts on that, and uh, I know we skipped you inadvertently earlier. If you have any thoughts that you wanted to throw in there too. That's okay. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I wanted to say to Carolyn, that was a beautiful poem, and the imagery of Jesus, who is the Almighty, debasing himself to wash the apostle, the, the disciples' feet, um, is the example that I would think our leadership would want to follow. And they aren't. Now the people on the ground, I think more of them are there. Their mindset is closer to that than the leadership seem to be. I don't know if it's because they're old. I don't know if it's because they see things from a uh, uh, outdated viewpoint, or if it's that the patriarchy is so deep and what that represents is power, power that they can't afford to lose. It is threatening. It is fear-based and it is not about love. It is not about service. It is not about being Christ-like. Jesus is not in charge of this. They have set him to the side and his example and, and they have said, that's lovely and fine, but we can't do that because it's threatening to us and our power and our authority over all these people. That's how I see it. And what happens then is you get people on the ground who are more enlightened and more ready to move forward saying, I can't be a part of this. This is stifling my soul. I know this is wrong. I can't do it anymore. 
I just can't go. And when they do go, they feel it in their body and they're triggered and they can't stay. This is what's happened to me and so many of my friends. And it's not that we don't love the church itself and the camaraderie and the, and the, the, um, the way everyone supports each other on the ward level. All of that's beautiful. It's the, the tippy top that is, in my mind, has corrupted themselves with power. And it's wrong. It is so wrong. What I heard that man say in that uh, text you just read, RFM, was he was saying, this may seem like a little thing, but what it's doing is it's bringing all of those feelings to the surface that we keep buried because we want to continue to support the church and be there. We want to keep going. We know that, you know, theoretically there are beautiful things about it, but when it's just simmering below the surface and then something like this happens, it brings it all to the top. And now women, especially who influence all their children are saying, I can't do this anymore. This is, this is hurting my soul. I can't do this. They're taking everything from me. And, and I feel like I felt like it was top down. It wasn't my Bishop. It wasn't my home teachers. It wasn't even my husband. It was way above that. Like Carolyn was saying, we're talking about up here wanting to maintain the position of power um, that has, you can't change their minds. How did, how does that happen? How do we tell them you can't act like this? They might want to put on a front, like, like with the women sitting on the stand now, the auxiliary leaders or whatever they are now. Um, that's a PR move. That's for the public to see. That is not what's happening now, obviously. So um, on the ground level, that is not carrying over. Uh, and I think people are smart enough to see that and they won't put up for, with it for long. I, I just, I don't see how they can. Thank you. Martine? Uh, one of the comments I made on Peggy, Peggy Fletcher Stack's uh, post about the article was thinking of many of my friends and not just many of my friends but myself for a number of years and still she persists convinced she can change the church from the inside she's exhausted and i think sister mcneil that relief society president who said it was like a slap in the face and those other women who are not referenced by name but uh, the ones that your friend uh, RFM mentioned, they're exhausted because they have been sustaining the priesthood for years, decades in our case, and I'm sure in their case too. And they don't see progress, obviously they see regression. Uh, about a year ago, uh, Carolyn, you did an interview with John DeLynn and in one of the segments, and I wanted to go back and listen to it again. Uh, this re refers to what you've just been talking about. And I may be putting words in your mouth. You may not have used those, those exact words, but you said something about going from competition to collaboration. Does that ring a bell? With regard to men and women and the priesthood that we need to move from sort of a competitive model to collaborating, which would require, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping you before, which would require some of those men or at least one, it, it, you know, it needs a spark. That movement needs a spark, a male spark willing to give up some of that perceived authority. Absolutely. And uh, whatever words I did use and what you remember that the, 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 the intent was absolutely correct, the, the way mm -hmm. that you described it. I have come to utilize more the words moving out of patriarchy mm -hmm. into partnership. Because okay. to me, I, I love the word mm -hmm. partnership. Yes, that may, that may be uh, 
that's probably what you said last year. Uh, yeah, and mm -hmm. back to that, that that text that was read, I was kind of surprised about, well, I've only recently learned about this thing of burn this letter or, you know, do, do <laughs> not do not pass along. And I mean, and that, that in, and of, in and of itself is so embarrassing. Don't Everything that is good and true should be up and above board and, and, and happily put on paper and happily passed around. Anything that does not uh, pass that, that test is, is wrong and dark and useless. Now, there has not been anything read in my, in my ward. I, and I don't, see, I'm not there right now mm -hmm. today, but uh, I would certainly have, have known if, if anything had been read from the pulpit. But this kind of secretive thing of, you know, just just pass the word along that this is the way it's going to be. I mean, that's just that's just humiliating and embarrassing and unworthy of the church that so many of us have given so much to. So there, there's just something going on here that is just sim simply wrong, just plain wrong. I remember when we were talking on the phone yesterday, uh, I had mentioned that if I'm in a position of authority and I'm making a decision that's going to impact other people, and my concern is that that decision not be traced back to me, then maybe that's a good indication that I shouldn't be making this decision in the first place. <laughs> we would think that that's a good clue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, we are almost up to the hour. And I want to address one other issue before we go. And I'll start with Carol Lynn, then we'll go back to Martine and Lila. But we have a situation now where women have been uh, accorded a certain uh, privilege, if I can call, call it that, that is not usually accorded to them. It's now been taken away. They've been taken off the stand. That's why this is called the stand down order to the women to get off the stand. And now some women and some men are registering disapproval of that decision to take them off the stand. What are other men who are in support of this decision saying about the women who are objecting? Carolyn. Well, the men that I know are very much in the camp of the women who are objecting. <laughs> Right, but you've heard some, right? Oh, yeah. And what do they say? The more orthodox men. Well, the more orthodox men that I run with are also the more progressive orthodox men. Um, so so they're, they're, they're ashamed and embarrassed that this thing has even, has even happened. Right, but there are some men, and I, I'll go ahead and remind you, of what it was that you said to me yesterday, because it stuck with me maybe more than it stuck with you, but that you're hearing indications of men saying things like, well, those women are, uh, to coin a phrase, uh, uppity, and they just want to be on the stand in order to have that special attention that they don't have otherwise. I'll go to Martine, because she's nodding her head right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't hear that from Carolyn, but unfortunately, I spent a little time on the on Peggy's uh, tweet yesterday and in the comments. And one man in particular, but he wasn't the only one, certainly. Uh, and actually, I did copy and paste. People should sit with their families in church unless they have a responsibility. This sounds oddly like a desire for power and superiority nested in a demand for equity. Uh, it would be equity if those on the stand could uh, stay sitting with family. Uh, also, um, men, sitting on the stand is no big deal. It's not about power or prestige. Also, men, we got to make sure women don't sit on the stand. So there were a lot uh, you know, a lot of those comments. They just want, they want to be seen. But that's why I was making the point that it's a two-way street. Yes, you're seeing. That's not why you want to sit there. But you're recognized as being one of the leaders in your ward. And the leader serves. 
That's the whole point. You are there to show that you serve this congregation. You are in a position to serve, whether it's the all the women, the children, the youth. Um, so that's my. So the reaction, I, I take it, and I'll get to you here in a second, Carolyn, and then Lila. Actually, I'll go Lila, then Carolyn, if that's okay. No, I'll do her first, because mm -hmm. she's, she's got more to say. That's good. Okay. All right. But is either it's denigration. All right. It's either to mm -hmm. denigrate the women who want to be on the stand. It's a tough sell because any argument you make against the women immediately can be applied to the men who are on the stand. Yeah. And why is it that only the women have bad motives for being on the stand and the women and the men's motives are pure as snow? <laughs> or the second thing is not to denigrate the women, but to denigrate the position of being on the stand. It's not that big a deal. So why is it the women would want this when they could be with their family and the men would want to be with their family as well and all that kind of stuff? So that's what I'm hearing from that. <laughs> now, Carolyn, yes, please. Sure. Well, no, I, I want to read one more little poem of mine, and I want it to be my last word. So, uh, Lila, here, you, you take up whatever you want to say, and then let me just have my last little word here. All right. Well, I think mainly I just wanted to echo what you just said about, you know, whatever can be applied to the women wanting recognition or, you know, some special, um, I don't know, uh, whatever you can say about them, you can also say about the men sitting up on the stand. Therefore, you know, it, it, let's be fair here. <laughs> we can't, it can't just be that the women want to be seen. What are the men doing up there? So, it's that precious patriarchy, the precious priesthood authority. They don't have to let go of their priesthood authority. What they have to let go of is the love of the adoration and the power and the control and the manipulation that they have by virtue of the priesthood and the patriarchy. And that is not what it is meant for. That is not what it is meant for. Now, I don't recall Jesus ever saying you men, because you have the priesthood, I don't even know if he mentioned priesthood. No. I don't think he did. That wasn't a thing. This is all a production of, you know, I, I, won't, I won't wax long and eloquent here, but it's man-made. So the men are protecting their power. The women aren't sitting up there because they want power. They want, it's not about that for the women, but I think it is about that for the men. And so they can't share it. They don't want to share it. They want the women to be sitting down. Now, if I had seven kids, no way am I going to go sit on the stand and leave my kids to take care of themselves on the bench. I know what that would look like. But if I don't have kids or my kids are old and grown, which they are now, and my husband was bishop and I was really society president, I would think I would have just as much right to be there as he did not because I have the priesthood, but because I'm a leader in my ward. Not that I want to be praised as a leader because that negates the whole meaning. Like you said, Martine, the, the calling is a service calling. It is not to be recognized. It is to be giving service. If we really want to follow Jesus and if the leadership believes in Jesus that they're trotting out this whole Jesus theme, they better take a look in the mirror. That's all I can say. Thank you, Lila. Since we're going to give Carolyn the last word, let's go by Martine and let you say anything you want to say in closing before we turn it over to Carolyn. You look like you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, because Carolyn's been broadening the issue and I was going to narrow it. Uh, Go ahead. Do whatever you want. <laughs> no, it's, you know, this this idea that who can sit on the stand and who can't. And like I said at the very first, there's it's not doctrinal. It's not, it, you know, it's tradition. And uh, there are good, re good functional reasons for certain people to be on the stand. And I'm sorry, it's not... It's not necessarily the way I wanted to end, but I'm I'm thinking. But well, seems to hear one of Carolyn's poems. Well, I think it was Jesus who um, upbraided people for coveting the chief seats 
he upbraided the Pharisees for coveting the chief yeah. seats in the synagogue, right? Yeah. So he did say something about people sitting in the chief seats, but it wasn't positive. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. Carolyn, will you bring us home? Well, I really want to thank you, um, RFN, for facilitating this. And, and I'm, I'm really grateful to get to know these, these two women. My life has been in, enriched in these moments that we've been talking here together. And <clears throat> I would like us to try to develop some reverence for the word equality which doesn't mean a lot of the things that, that somehow when we, we throw darts at that word. Equality of value, equality of contribution, doesn't mean that we do exactly the same kinds of things. We're, the, the, the poem that I, I came to last night that I, I would like to share here, the title is Position. And we've been talking here about position of who sits up here and who is just down in the congregation. And, and I hope this might just give us a little bit of a boost. Position. If A looks up to B, then by nature of the physical universe, B must look down on A. Rather like two birds positioned, one on a tree and one on the ground. Or so thought Marjorie, who had always wanted to marry a man she could look up to, but wondered where that would place her if she did. Imagine her astonishment when she met Michael and found that together they stood physics on its head you could never draw this on paper for it defies design. But year after year, they lived a strange arrangement that by all known laws could not occur. She looked up to him and he looked up to her. Now, I think we can do that. I think we can do that in our personal relationships. I think we can do this in however we want to manage the management of church. That women can look up to men. And men can look up to women. And we can stand where it's essential. We can sit where it seems useful. And we're all one. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Martine. Thank you, Lila. Thank you, RFM, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go ahead. I'll close out the show. Thank you once again. I'll remove you one at a time because that's all I can do. And we'll talk to you later. Thank you again so much, everybody, for joining us for this episode. Please hit like. Please hit subscribe subscribe, uh, rather. So that's about all for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I know I have. And until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon signing off the air.